let's do this again. Happy Mother's Day to all you moms out there. I hope you're showered with love today and every day for that matter. Mother's Day is an occasion to express respect, honor, and love towards mothers. Kind of sounds like one of the Ten Commandments, doesn't it? I'd like to paint a little picture of motherhood for you today. This was taken from the April 19th reading of our daily bread. I thought it was pretty fitting. As they sang praise songs together in the multi-generational worship service, many experienced joy and peace, but not a frazzled mother. As she jiggled her baby on her hip, who was on the verge of crying, she held the songbook for her five-year-old while trying to stop her toddler from running off. Sound familiar, moms? Moms have special gifts from God that us men don't have. The strength to carry a child around on her hip for hours during the day. A loving touch as she gently runs her fingers through the child's hair. A soothing voice to comfort with. And the look that sends fear through all of us. Us husbands too, as she asks them to listen and obey. Kids, your moms worry about you. What you're doing and where you are. In Luke chapter 2, Verse 41 through 45, during the feast of the Passover, scripture tells us of a time when Jesus had his parents a little worried. And I'm going to read that. It says, every year his parents went to Jerusalem for the feast of the Passover. When he was 12 years old, they went up to the feast according to the custom. After the feast was over, while his parents returned home, the boy Jesus stayed behind in Jerusalem. But they were unaware of it. Thinking he was in their company... They traveled on for a day. Then they began looking for him among the relatives and friends. When they did not find him, they went back to Jerusalem to look for him. After three days, that's a day out, a day back, and a day in Jerusalem. Think they were a little worried? After three days, they found him in the temple court, sitting among the teachers, listening to them and asking them questions. Everyone who heard him was amazed at his understanding and his answers. When his parents saw him, they were astonished. Kind of a key word, astonished. I think I'd be a little worried, maybe a little upset. But his mother said to him, Son, son, why have you treated us like this? Your father and I have been anxiously searching for you. Why were you searching for me, he asked. Didn't you know I had to be in my father's house? But they did not understand what he was saying to them. Then he went down to Nazareth with them and was obedient to them. But his mother treasured all these things in her heart. So you see, Jesus pointed to the, his personal duty to his Father in heaven. He contrasted his My Father, capital F, with Mary's Your Father, small f. At the age of 12 years old, Jesus was aware of his unique relationship he had to God. But he was also obedient to his earthly parents. So today, as you celebrate Mother's Day, be reminded of these four things that mothers want from their children that money can't buy. A visit, a hug, a phone call, and the words, I love you. She's clothed with strength and dignity. She can laugh at the days to come. She speaks with wisdom and faithful instruction is on her tongue. She watches over the affairs of her household and does not eat the bread of idleness. Her children arise and call her blessed, her husband also, and he praises her, saying, Many women do noble things, but you surpass them all. Charm is deceptive, and beauty is fleeting, but a woman who fears the Lord is to be praised. Give her the reward she has earned, and let her works bring praise at the city gate. That's from Proverbs 31, 25 through 31. So if you're visiting with us today, you've accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, we invite you to participate with us in this time of communion. Let's pray. Father, we, uh, we take this special day to lift up our mothers to you and, and give them a special blessing. But we also praise you for giving up your son to us, that he would come and die on a cross for us and bury our sins in that grave with him so that we may have eternal life in heaven and sit beside you and our loved ones who have gone before us. 
So now as we take these elements, Lord, we just review our hearts and our minds. And we thank you for all that you've done for us. In Jesus' name, amen. You know, when I was a kid, I asked my mom, Mom, we, we celebrate Mother's Day. We celebrate Father's Day. When is Children's Day? And with a huge sigh, she said, Every day is Children's Day. <laughs> Oh, yeah. Well, on behalf of the Kimball Christian Church, I want to wish you a very happy Mother's Day. Today is a day, of course, in which we uh, specifically celebrate moms, but I want to widen our view for just a moment this morning and take some time to celebrate all of our sisters in Christ who love Jesus and who desire to be a woman after God's own heart. Steve read it from uh, Proverbs 31 earlier. A woman who fears the Lord is to be praised. So all right, ladies, all you ladies here who love Jesus and seek to honor him with your life, can I get a big amen? Amen. All right. Ladies, you are invaluable and indispensable members of the church, the body of Christ. And I simply want to say on behalf of your church family, Thank you. Thank you for blessing this community of believers with your love and passion for for Christ and his church. We need you. So being a a parent is a a tough job, no matter what generation you come from. From Adam and Eve to present day, parenting has always been filled with joy and sorrow, with successes and failures, with triumphs and regret. And for many moms here this morning, Mother's Day is a joyful day, a day to celebrate and to relish. But we need to acknowledge, though, that for some moms, uh, Mother's Day can be a painful day, in fact, perhaps because of a loss or estrangement or maybe some personal regrets or failures as a mom or even from your own experiences as a daughter or a daughter-in-law. Whichever camp you fall into today, this morning, um, maybe you fall into more than one, I want you to know that your church family is here to to share in your joys, the joys of Mother Day, and also the tears. When I was uh, first assigned this Sunday to preach, I first swallowed hard, and then God gave me the sense enough to ask for some help. A few weeks back, I texted several moms in our church that I have a a great respect for and asked them two questions. First of all, what word from God do moms need to hear on this Mother's Day? And secondly, what does the church need to hear on this Mother's Day? And I'm grateful for the responses that these ladies texted back. Truth be told, much of what I am sharing this morning and even the outline of my message came right from the hearts of these moms as they shared. So what word from God do moms need to hear? I've categorized the answers under what seemed to me to be three core issues. (laughs) Identity sufficiency, and community. Here's some of the responses they shared. Under identity, to feel accepted by God and by others. Some days a person does not feel worthy. Under sufficiency, sometimes I don't feel like I have what it takes to do this. Did I do enough as they were growing up? Am I doing enough as they are adults? Am I praying enough for them? Am I enough? Under community, sometimes I feel like I'm all alone in this. Can you relate to any of these, Mom? See, I want to look at uh, three messages of encouragement from God's Word this morning. Uh, A message for each of these core issues that these moms identified The gospel of Christ addresses each of these issues so very wonderfully. But really, 
the encouragements that I want to share this morning are not only just for moms, church. These words from Jesus are for every member of God's family who has been called to have an influence for the gospel in the lives of others. That's each of us. So, for the issue of identity. For the issue of identity, Jesus says, you are first and foremost my child. Now, moms, you wear a lot of hats. Caregiver, nurse, counselor, lawyer, chauffeur, accountant, teacher, warden, housekeeper, therapist, cook, miracle worker. And with the busyness that all of the responsibilities and demands of parenting brings, it's easy to fall into the trap of thinking that what we do defines who we are. That our performance as a parent is the essence of our identity. And this is a trap because none of us performs perfectly all of the time. In spite of the successes and joys of parenting, moms sometimes feel overwhelmed and discouraged by their flaws and failures. Now I want us to think about our identity for a moment. Identity is the truth about what something or who something is. Imagine if the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ was the most defining mark of your view of yourself. How would that change things for you? If Jesus were to sit down with you this morning, toe to toe, face to face, and look you in the eye, the most important thing that he would want you to remember, Mom, is that if you are in Christ, before you were a mother, you were a blood-bought daughter of Jesus, your Savior. John 1, verses 12 through 13 says, To all who have received him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. In Christ Jesus, you are his daughter. Author Bill Galtier writes this, If you are in Christ, the truth about who you are is found in the truth of God's word. Having our identity in Christ means believing and living according to what God says about you. To have your identity in Christ means you are placing your confidence for life and eternity in the Lord Jesus Christ. It means that your character is being formed into the image of Jesus. In Christ, you find the freedom and the power to be who God has made and redeemed you to be. Tim Keller boils down the def definition of identity in this way. The world says that my identity is based on my good performance. The gospel of Christ says that my identity is not built on my record or my performance, but on Christ's. So let's just spend a moment hearing again from God's word what God says about those who are in Christ Jesus. 1 John 3, 2, I am a child of God. John 15, 9, I am loved. Acts 13, 39, I am forgiven through Christ. 1 Peter 1, 16, I am holy through Christ. Romans 6, 6, I am no longer a slave to sin. Romans 6, 11, I am alive in Christ. 2 Corinthians 5, 17, I am a new creation. Ephesians 3, 16, I am strengthened with power through the Holy Spirit. Ephesians 1, 6, I am accepted. Romans 8, 1, I am no longer condemned. Galatians 2, 20, I am crucified with Christ and he lives in me. 2 Corinthians 5, 20, I am an ambassador for Christ. So many, many more. But mom in Christ, 
Before you are a mother, you are a blood-bought daughter of Jesus, your Savior. You are first and foremost a child of God. That is who you are if you are in Jesus. And as such, your highest calling is to faithfully love Jesus in front of your family. Which brings us to the second word from Christ this morning. So for the issue of sufficiency, Jesus says, you have a very important calling, but only I am the Savior. Parents, we have a tremendous important calling in raising children to know and love the Lord. Uh, Deuteronomy 6 verses 5 through 7 says, Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength. These commands that I give to you today are to be on your hearts. Impress them on your children. Talk about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road, when you lie down and when you get up. This passage teaches us, uh, moms and dads, that we are, we are first to love God ourselves. We are first to obey him ourselves. Verse 5 comes before verse 7. Loving God is our highest calling, and as we do that, only then will we be able to properly teach our children what it is to love God and follow his commands. What else does this calling for moms and dads entail? Well, parents are to love and serve others and teach their children to do the same. We are to faithfully teach our children about God's greatness, about his faithfulness, his goodness, his, his forgiveness, and the good news of Jesus. We are to care enough about our kiddos to discipline them and correct them when they sin. We are to teach through our example and through our instruction what it means to not conform to the pattern of this world and how to be transformed by renewing our minds through God's word. Moms and dads are to impress on our sons and daughters the love for the church, God's family, and help our kids to discover their place of service in Christ and his church. Not many of you uh, knew my parents Wally and Dee. Uh, I count it a tremendous blessing to have had them as, as my parents. Some of you know that uh, my dad was a pastor and that I am the youngest of the seven of their children. Now my mom and dad, they loved Jesus, they loved his church, and they loved their kids. They taught each of us to know and love the Lord. They took us to the church. They, they took us to youth group. They, they taught youth group. They, they brought us to camp. They read scriptures to us around the supper table each day. They provided discipline, correction, and wise counsel. My parents faithfully prayed for each of their kids from the day we were born and as we grew older and eventually left the home. You would think that what I described is the formula for great spiritual success. Would it surprise you to know that uh, some of my siblings have wandered far from the Lord and don't seem to be at all interested in pursuing a relationship with Jesus? A parent's efforts to raise up their children to know and love the Lord is so crucial and so vital, but ultimately the, the success of our parental efforts doesn't depend on us. Mom and dad, you have an important calling, yes, but only Jesus is the Savior. In other words, only Jesus can change your kids' hearts. The Bible calls this being born again, or regeneration. Only Jesus can bring spiritual life to the spiritually dead, and that's what each of us are with out Christ, we are spiritually dead, even our kiddos. Parents must depend on the transforming work of Jesus Christ to bring fruit to this calling that he has given us to raise up children to know and love the Lord. We must teach, yes, 
but only Jesus can transform. God gives us some tremendously helpful encouragement and perspective from his word here. God loves our children more than we could ever know. Psalm 139, 16. Your eyes saw my unformed body, and all the days adorned, uh, ordained for me were written in your book before one of them came to be. Jeremiah 31, 3 says, I have loved you with an everlasting love. I have drawn you with unfailing kindness. God is also working to bring your kids to salvation and to bring your believing children safely to heaven. Psalm 127, 1 Unless the Lord builds the house, the, the, build, the builders labor in vain. 2 Peter 3, 9, He is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. 1 Corinthians 7, uh, excuse me, 3, verses 7 through 9. So neither the one who plants nor the one who waters is anything, but only God who makes things grow. The one who plants and the one who waters have one purpose, and they will each be rewarded according to their own labor. For we are co-laborers in God's service, but it is God who makes things grow. And Philippians 1.6, being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. God also invites us to seek his power through prayer. Do not be anxious about anything, Philippians chapter 4, verses 6 through 7, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Parents, keep on praying for your children, your adult children, and your siblings, I might add. Even when we can't see it, God is working. Keep praying. God is also working in us to fulfill his calling as parents. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10. For we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. John 15, 5. I am the vine, you are the branches. If you remain in me, and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. Church, uh, how much can we do apart from Jesus? Nothing. 2 Corinthians 12, 9. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses so that Christ's power may rest on me. Moms, dads, church, we are all keenly aware of our weaknesses, aren't we? But Jesus assures us that his provision for us through his grace is sufficient. Rachel P. in her book, Mom Enough writes, Is God God enough to take my best stained efforts at childbearing and craft something that brings him pleasure? Is God God enough to turn little hearts to him and to hold them there? God always has been and always will be God enough. Living in his perfect sufficiency, I will live to parent for another day. Never mom enough, but filled with the one who is always enough. One last word from Jesus brings us to the issue of community. For the issue of community, Jesus says, you belong to my family. Blogger Rachel Davis writes this. Motherhood can sometimes feel very lonely. There will be moments, no doubt, when you face a parenting struggle or are faced with your own failures or fears and motherings that you may be tempted to think, 
No one else can possibly understand what I'm going through or feeling. When these feelings and lies creep in, you must fight them and with the truth that not only do you have a God who has promised to never leave you or forsake you and who is able to sympathize with you and your weaknesses, but you are also surrounded by an army of fellow sisters in Christ who are on this journey of motherhood alongside with you. This is, the one, this is one of the great blessings of being vitally connected to a good church. We strive to be a good church here. And whether you've been coming to Kimball Christian Church all of your life or just started to attend recently, I want you to know that this church's heart desire is for you to be, first of all, vitally connected to Jesus as your Savior and Lord. And secondly, we want to be a blessing to you. Our vision is to be a, an authentic community where families flourish. And whether you are a mom or a dad, a parent or child, young, old, married, widowed, singled, or divorced, we want you to know that you have a place here. You have a family here. Uh, not a perfect family for sure, but we continue to seek God's grace and mercy to make us into the loving family that God intends for us to be. Through everything we do within this building, in our communities and beyond, we strive to love God, to, to love others, and to serve in, in order to fulfill our mission to go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, and in teaching them to obey everything Jesus has commanded us. We believe that the, the Bible is the inspired word of God without errors and is provided to us as the final authority of all matters of faith and teaching. In light of all of the confusion that exists in our world today about marriage and sexual, sexuality, allow me to take just a moment to clearly affirm where we stand on these issues, especially if you're new to Kimball Christian Church you may have been wondering. The Bible clearly teaches that God has wonderfully and, and immutably created each person in his image as either a biological male or a biological female. It is his work alone. These two distinct and complementary genders together reflect the image of God. The term marriage has only one meaning in Scripture. It is the uniting of one biological male and one biological female in a single exclusive union. We believe that God intends sexual expression to occur only between a man and a woman who are married to each other and that no intimate sexual activity be engaged in outside of a marriage between a man and a woman. God calls each of us to turn from our sins and, to, and offers redemption and restoration through Jesus Christ to all who confess and repent of their sins, no matter what the sin name is. We are all sinners who have been saved by God's grace, and every person must be afforded compassion, love, kindness, respect, dignity, whatever their past sins may be. I want to, to close with an encouragement and a challenge for the church this morning. Galatians chapter 6 verses 9 to 10 says this, Let us not become weary in doing good, for at the proper time we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all people, especially to those who belong to the family of believers. KCC family, so many of you are actively engaged in some sort of ministry here. Uh, your church family benefits from your labors. Thank you. Thank you. Keep it up. We need you. Last week, uh, Ed Goff challenged each of us to get out of the stands and get into the game. If you're looking for a way to engage in ministry here, I hope that you will talk with Kevin or Joe or one of the elders or any of the committee members, 
to, to find out how you can plug in. I wanted to share what one of the moms texted back to me in, in response to the question, what does the church need to hear on this Mother's Day? Here's what she said. Please don't retire from serving the children and youth of the church once your own have grown. For a season of rest, of course. To a different calling of ministry, perhaps. I can understand that. I need all generations, especially more men, to continue to step up and be the church to my family, especially my kids, to help disciple them, but also to shore up the discipleship that my husband and I are already doing, and to disciple us as young parents. We need your wisdom and grace. She continues, a common thread for all moms in the thick of the child rearing years is this. It is very difficult to be Jesus to my children if I'm not able to be fed and have fellowship with other adults because I'm serving in children's ministry. What's the adage? You can't pour from an empty cup. Maybe it's not a matter of being a Sunday school teacher or working with Awana. Maybe it's befriending and mentoring a younger couple and doing life together. Maybe it's a, a weekly visit to play with the kids or hold the baby so mom can take a nap or a shower. I know this is happening, she says, in many of the relationships at our church. To encourage it to happen in broader terms would be excellent. So let's sum up. Mom, if Jesus were to sit down with you this morning, toe to toe, face to face, and, and look you in the eye, he would want you to remember that in him you find your identity. You are first and foremost his child. In him you find your sufficiency. You have an important calling, yes, but he, only he is the Savior. Yours and your families. Fulfill your calling with the power and the wisdom he provides and trust him to do the work that only he could do. In his church, you find community. You have a place here. You belong to his family. And church family, these dear ladies belong to us. Let's serve them and their families. Let's pray for them, encourage them, celebrate them, love on them. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for Dolores Blanchard. made such a difference in my life. Thank you for taking her failed and flawed efforts and using them to speak into my life. Thank you for bringing your message of salvation to me, first from the lips of my parents and from the church, through your word. Thank you, Father, for saving me through Jesus Christ. And we all are grateful, Lord, for the salvation that you have brought to us through Christ our Lord. It is only he who saves. Thank you for the wonderful salvation that we have, redemption, forgiveness of sin, the hope of an eternity with you, with your family. And now, Lord, we pray this blessing. For this reason, I kneel before the Father, from whom his whole family in heaven on earth derives its name. I pray that out of his glorious riches he may strengthen you with power 
through His Spirit in your innermost being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power together with all the saints to grasp how wide and long and, and, and high and deep is the love of Christ. And to know this love that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of Christ. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than, than all we ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work within us, to him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and, in, and ever. And the church said, Amen.